Okay, here we are, the final lecture in this lecture series. This lecture corresponds to chapter 12 of the textbook Applied Statistics, and it is entitled Structural Equation Modeling in Practice. My name is Professor Andrew Timming, and I want to extend a warm welcome to those of you dropping in either to this particular lecture or those of you who have faithfully attended and participated in every single lecture in this lecture series. The current lecture, Structural Equation Modeling in Practice, obviously builds upon the previous lecture, which provided an introduction to structural equation modeling. So it naturally follows that if you have not listened already to chapter 12, lecture one, then you are strongly urged to press pause on this video and view that lecture first. Uh, at the same time, I would recommend you also listen to the lectures of chapter 11, as well as reading chapter 11 from the textbook, because uh, the basic principles of structural equation modeling were already introduced to you in chapter 11 in the context of confirmatory factor analysis. So as I said in the previous lecture, we provided a brief introduction to structural equation modeling. And in this particular lecture, we will go through an example of a structural equation model. And I will walk you through the various components of a path diagram and talk to you about how to carry out a structural equation model in practice. I hope you enjoy not only this final lecture in the lecture series, but that you have enjoyed all of the lectures so far across all 12 chapters of the textbook. This, of course, is the textbook that we've been using through this course and the textbook that corresponds to this lecture series. Uh, I hope once again that you've enjoyed reading it. Uh, and I look forward to any feedback that you might have on how I can improve the textbook for the second edition, which I imagine I should be working on in the not too distant future. All right, so in the previous lecture, in chapter 12, lecture one, I walked you through the concept of the path diagram. And you will recall that I explained that structural equation modeling is a very visual methodology. Uh, it relies heavily on graphical representations to help us visualize the relationships uh, at hand, the relationships that we're trying to analyze using this particular method, analysis of covariance structures. And you can see on the right-hand side of this slide an example of a structural equation modeling path diagram. Uh, and I won't go through every detail of this figure in this slide because the next uh, several slides will look at various components of this model. So by the time you go through the next several slides, you will understand uh, essentially what is being hypothesized in this hypothetical example of a structural equation model. But the first point I want to make before we jump in is that when you look at this model, you can see a lot of arrows and the arrows are typically moving from the left uh, to the right. In other words, from our exogenous or independent variables on the left towards our endogenous or dependent variables on the right. And it may be tempting to look at these arrows, these primarily one-way arrows, and infer some kind of causality or some kind of causation in these relationships. Uh, and as I've told you uh, previously in relation to other methods that we've covered in this book, you need to be very cautious about doing so. So if you look at the diagram on your right, it appears at first glance that the X variables, so you can see these as X1, X2, uh, and X3, with uh, x3 being a latent variable is signaled by the fact that it has a circle around it rather than a square. These three variables are sequentially, apparently sequentially influencing each other. And because of the arrows, it looks as though they are causing a particular outcome y. Uh, in this case, uh, 
Uh, y is also a latent variable because you can see a circle is around it rather than a square. But I would urge you that when you're reporting the results of a path analysis, it's always important to use realistic and tempered language. So you never say that x1 causes x2 or x2 causes x3. It's always important to use more realistic language such as x is positive x1 is positively associated with x2 or positively related to x2 but never say x1 causes x2 because causation is difficult to establish definitively for various reasons now you'll recall in the chapter on multiple regression analysis that was chapter nine i believe of the textbook uh, we discussed the concept of mediation and we talked a little bit about how to analyze the mediation in the context of multiple regression structural equation modeling is also ideally suited for analyzing mediating or intervening relationships uh, and the advantage of course of structural equation modeling is that you can look at uh, mediating variables that are latent as opposed to observable variables, which you can do in the context of multiple regression. So mediation can be defined as a situation in which the indirect effect of X1 on Y through X2 is stronger than the direct effect of X1 on Y. So you can see this uh, illustrated in the graph uh, and the path diagram on the right-hand side of the slide. X1 has a direct line going to Y1, so there's a direct relationship there, but X1 is also indirectly related to Y through X2. And there are two different types of mediation that we can analyze in this context. The first is what we call a full mediation. A full mediation is when the relationship between X1 and Y is explained fully by X2, the mediating variable where x2 is uh, the subject of an indirect relationship between x1 and y so in a full mediation you will find a non-significant relationship direct relationship between x1 and y but a significant relationship through x2 between x1 and y so x1 significantly is associated with x2 which in turn is significantly associated with y so that's a full mediation when there's no direct effect but there is a significant indirect effect there's also such thing as something called a partial mediation and a partial mediation is such that there is a significant direct effect between x1 and y in other words the relationship the direct relationship between x1 and y is statistically significant but the relationship between x1 and y through x2 is not only also statistically significantly uh, related, but also uh, a stronger relationship than the direct relationship, right? So in this particular triangle at the top of the diagram, uh, x2 is what we refer to as a mediating variable, a mediator, or an intervening variable. Okay, you'll also recall during the discussion of multiple regression that we talked about a unique situation entitled moderation so a moderating effect can also be analyzed in the context of sem in addition to in, in multiple regression so having a look at the path diagram again to the right in, in terms of the structural model the relationship between x1 and x2 as well as the relationship between x1 and x3 is presumed to change at different levels of a third variable and that's z1 so you can see z1 there with arrows going into the direct arrows between x1 and x2 and x1 and x3 so what does this mean what we're assuming when there's a moderating effect hypothesized is that the relationship between two variables changes depending on the level of some third variable in this case z1 
So when values of Z1 are low, and we can define that perhaps as one standard deviation below the mean, then the relationship, let's say, between X1 and X2 might be neutral. That is to say, there's, there's no relationship between X1 and X2 when values of Z are one standard deviation below the mean. When values of Z1 are average, that is to say at the mean, then it's possible you might find that the relationship between X1 and X2 might be slightly positive, but not statistically significant, right? So we're moving a level up in terms of that moderating variable. And when values of Z1 are high, so now we're looking at uh, one standard deviation above the mean, then we might find that the relationship between X1 and X2 could be positive and statistically significant. So what this means is that there is no one relationship between X1 and X2. The relationship between X1 and X2 depends on the level of some third variable, in this case, Z. So that would be an example of testing a moderating effect. Now, one feature of the path diagram on the right that you won't be familiar with is the concept of a disturbance term. And you can see three disturbance terms uh, associated with this model. So there's D1, you can see a circle with a line, an arrow going down to X2 at the top. And then there's D2, and you can see a line going across to X sub three. And then you can see D3, which is a circle with a line going down to Y1. So the disturbance terms are similar to what we described as residuals or error terms in the context of multiple regression. So in multiple regression, you'll remember that the multiple regression equation, which is Y equals B1 times X1 plus B2 times X2 dot, 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 et cetera, et cetera, plus uh, A, which is the y-intercept, plus E, which is the error term. And I advise you just to drop E because we don't have to explicitly model the error term in multiple regression. However, we do need to explicitly model the error terms or the disturbance terms in structural equation modeling every time that a variable is endogenous. So you can see that there are three endogenous variables here. X2 is endogenous because X1 has an arrow going towards it. Uh, X3 is endogenous because X1 has an arrow going towards it. And Y1 is endogenous because there are multiple arrows going towards it. So anytime a variable is endogenous, whether it's a observable variable or an un unobservable latent variable, you will need to explicitly model a disturbance term. And what that disturbance term tells you in the context of this model is that it is the sum of every other variable that hasn't been included in your model, primarily because it hasn't been measured. You can't measure and incorporate everything. So these disturbance terms are telling you that there may be an effect of X1 on X2, but there is any number of other variables that can also have an effect on X2, right? So as I said, Unlike in multiple regression, uh, disturbance paths have to be always explicitly modeled in path diagrams. They can't just be assumed or sort of hanging out in the background. Uh, and as I also said, the general rule here is that a disturbance term is needed anytime you have an endogenous dependent variable in your model. And again, whether that variable is a latent variable or an observable variable, you still need to explicitly model the disturbance term. You will also recall in our discussion of multiple regression, as well as logistic regression, that you can include control variables into your analyses. And the advantage of having control variables in your multivariate analyses is that by controlling for the influence of those covariates, you're able to identify and understand, discover the pure relationship between a given X variable and Y. Now, in the context of multiple regression, you obviously don't need to create a path diagram. You can simply build your model logically. Uh, and the existence of control variables can kind of hang out in the background. They don't have to be 
the focus of your study. You can simply include them in your model. But in structural equation modeling, they have to be explicitly factored into the path diagram. And you can see here, I have included two control variables, C1 and C2. These are uh, just below Y1, just below our outcome variable here. And both C1 and C2 are single item measures. You can see that they're indicated by squares and not circles. And essentially what we're doing is we're saying, yes, we assume this complex relationship between X1 and Y through X2 and X3, but we also recognize that there are other variables, for example, C1 and C2, that can also influence Y, right? So in theory, when you include control variables like this, C1 and C2, your disturbance term should go down. They should weaken because you're suddenly explicitly modeling additional potential effects in your model. But the important point is that if you want to include control variables in structural equation modeling, they have to be explicitly included in the model. You actually have to create uh, single item indicators <clears throat> that will predict various outcomes. Now, there are two different types of structural models. There's what we call a recursive structural equation model and what we call a non-recursive structural equation model. A recursive model is one in which the directionality of the relationship flows only in one direction. So it goes only from the left and it ends to the right. The example you can see on the right is not recursive. And the reason you know this is that if you look at the relationship between X2 and Y1, you can see one arrow moving in the direction from X2 to Y1, but you can also see a parallel arrow moving from Y1 back to X2. So you can see two directions of arrows uh, across those two variables. Now, most SEM models are recursive. They're sort of simple uh, directions from left to right, but some are non-recursive, such as the one you can see on the right here. So a non-recursive model is one that allows for two-way feedback loops. Uh, and by including these two-way feedback loops, in theory, you can bolster claims to causality, notwithstanding what I said <clears throat> earlier about the importance of avoiding uh, causality language altogether. I still believe that's the case. But if you include non-recursive elements to a model, you're uh, strengthening in some way your ability to suggest that a particular exogenous variable does seem to have a direct uh, impact on a particular endogenous variable. Okay, lastly, I wanted to bring your attention to the concept of the modification indices. And this should be a familiar term because we talked about modification indices in chapter 11, where we looked at confirmatory factor analysis, which essentially only looks at the measurement element of a structural equation model. A modification index refers to an exploratory, so not a confirmatory, but an exploratory statistical technique that will help us to improve model fit post hoc. Post hoc meaning after you've done the first round of confirmatory analysis. And the way you can improve it is by using these, modif these modification indices to re-specify, that is to say to add, delete, or co-vary some of the relationships, items, or variables in either the structural and or the measurement model. So similar to confirmatory factor analysis, structural equation modeling is technically strictly confirmatory. As I said earlier, you're, you're testing theory, right? You wanna see whether or not your theory of how these variables relate to each other is right or not. If it's not right, if you do a poor job in terms of confirming your theory, you can, in theory, use these modification indices to re-specify the model in an exploratory way in order to improve overall model fit. So if you end up with what you consider to be a poor fitting model, you can use these indices post hoc to improve the overall fit. But I would urge extreme caution in the use of modification indices 
because uh, some researchers, not all, but some uh, view this as a form of not quite cheating, um, but perhaps not a straight way uh, to carry out uh, structural equation modeling. So when it comes to assessing overall fit in structural equation modeling, as well as confirmatory factor analysis, we don't have at our disposal R squared, which is the statistic we use in multiple regression to assess overall model fit. Uh, we don't have pseudo R squared, which is used in logistic regression. Instead, we have a whole series of goodness of fit statistics in the context of analysis of covariant structures. Uh, and these were first reported to you in chapter 11, again, where we'd learned about confirmatory factor analysis, but I've uh, reproduced some of them here. So you would look at the chi-square statistic, the RMSCA, there's the NFI, CFI, IFI, RFI, and TLI statistics, the SRMR, the PCLOS, Holters, and Paratio. Again, there's any number of them, a great many of them, but these are some of the more common ones and the cutoffs uh, you can find also in the slide. All right, let's summarize what you've learned so far in chapter 12. I would congratulate you on learning how to create, to model, and to interpret a structural equation model. This is not an easy uh, statistical method. That was, this is what you would consider a, an advanced statistical method, uh, and it um, requires quite a lot of training to be able to use them properly. But you now know about the various uh, components of a structural equation model, including mediation effects, moderation effects, disturbance terms, controls, uh, as well as the difference between recursive and non-recursive models. And you also know how to use modification indices, uh, but I would urge you, of course, to use them responsibly. And you have a good understanding of how to assess overall model fit in structural equation models. At this stage, I would ask you to pause your video and go through either individually or in groups these six questions as they will help you better understand the material that was presented in chapter 12. And please allow me to give one final thank you. Thank you very much for listening to this lecture series. We've gone through 12 chapters together uh, and we've culminated with structural equation modeling, which you learned about in this lecture and the, the previous one. And I just wanna say it's been a pleasure. I hope you have enjoyed these lectures. I hope you enjoy the book. And uh, I bid you adieu. Bye, everyone.